This is the second part of my review of Master of the Night, Book 3 in the official Escape from Tarkov trilogy. If you haven't watched Part 1 or my reviews of the first two books, please go back and watch them now. Upon entering the tunnel, a cultist informs Peter that a conduit that houses all kinds of wires has been severed in the explosion. Ivan asks why this is important, and Peter tells him that because all of the various technology that can be found in the tunnels is fed through those lines, so that someone can observe everything going on down there. And if communication or power is severed in one area, a repair crew will be out shortly to repair it. Whoever's in charge of these crews, according to Peter, care very little about what happens on the surface of Tarkov, and they only care about whatever is going on underground. It is also implied that the repair crew comes ready for a fight. Ivan orders his men to hunker down and take cover in the tunnel, but he notices two raiders, dispatched from other raider groups, produce their radios and relay what has just occurred and what might occur soon to the respective leaders. Ivan thinks to himself that it won't be long before this place is crawling with raiders, all looking to get in on the action. After encountering one of Dennis's booby traps, the cultists decide that it's too risky to try to disarm the traps, and instead, they will tunnel around it. The raiders are now chomping at the bit for some action, and begin to think that the cultists are too cautious. After successfully navigating around a trap and proceeding down a long, straight tunnel, body parts from both cultists and raiders begin to be torn from their bodies as a Dishka 12.7mm heavy machine gun roars to life at the end of the corridor. Through the chaos and carnage, nobody gets a good look at who or what is behind it, but it's none other than Dennis. Not a single cultist survives the onslaught, and only six raiders make it back to the surface. Now topside, the surviving raiders are in shock from what had occurred, but Peter manages to calm them down with an eerily soothing mantra, and they explain what had happened. As the raiders and however many cultists that were on the surface think of what to do next, it cuts back to Dennis. Dennis has traveled very deep into the tunnels now, by his estimates, at least a few kilometers, and he judges that the section of tunnel he is in now should be right along the coastline somewhere. The tunnel has gotten very narrow, in some places only a meter wide, which makes Dennis wonder again what these tunnels were used for. They weren't for transporting anything as there are no railways or signs of vehicles, and with some corridors being so tight, that would have been impossible anyways. He finally finds a small keypad that accepts the same flash drive he used to access the underground with. Inside is a small office, which he reckons is an observation post. Accessing a computer inside, he finds that to no surprise, this is all Terra Group equipment. He also manages to find a directive for USEC, issued by Terra Group. It reads as thus. Set up posts that block the coastal highway and prevent the passage of enemy forces from the direction of the lighthouse and the roadblocks of the Russian interior forces. Ensure unobstructed evacuation of all persons from the sanatorium onto the arrival boats. Upon execution of the order, disassemble the posts, clearing up traces of your presence if possible, and move back to the main base by land. Dennis figures that these tunnels must have been designed for USEC to use so that they could navigate around Tarkov without being seen, as well as disappear if need be. The observation bunker in this section of tunnel is complete with a command room, kitchen, barracks, weapons and food storage rooms, and a head which also features a shower. He rewrites his flash key so that it will only open with his specific key from now on, and then rests. The book then cuts to Mark Forbit, the USEC counterintelligence officer. A junior computer analyst from either USEC or Terra Group urgently requests to speak with him. Turns out that Terra Group's computer system has logged every single use of flash keys, and a top secret program that runs on the Terra Group system, named Torch, uses algorithms to detect suspicious activities. The key Dennis has been using was flagged under the system, and once looked into, the analyst discovered that the key holder has been recorded as dead and that the key Dennis is currently in possession of has the highest level of clearance within the Terra Group organization. Basically, Dennis can access anything he wants. When Dennis used the computer in the underground observation post, the webcam on the computer took a photo of his face, a face that Mark Forbit recognizes. Mr. Forbit then calls the most experienced USAC team leader on the base and instructs him to go track down Dennis and that he must be captured alive. Later on, Mr. Forbit has another conversation but this time with a senior computer analyst from Terra Group. In this conversation, if I was reading the book right, a major bomb was dropped. Dennis is actually a well-known and extremely talented freelance hacker. Somehow this information was missed by Terra Group while he was working there, and how this information comes to light now is a mystery. 
but he may be a mole inside the Terra Group Corporation. His motivations? Unknown. He was working with another hacker who goes by the alias Drill, and the first stirrings of their relationship was an incident within the Terra Group Corporation that now goes by the name, codename Nevermore, where there was a massive intrusion to the central Terra Group database located in Antwerp. This further surprises and worries Mr. Forbit, as this mole now has access to pretty much anything owned by Terra Group within Tarkov. The book cuts to the experienced and combat-hardened USEC team sent to exterminate Dennis. On their way to execute their mission, they are ambushed by a ragtag group of scavs, whom despite their lack of gear or military training, have refined their style of ambush. The ambush is successful at first, killing several of the USEC and wounding several more, but the USEC guys respond with overwhelming firepower and underbarrel grenade launchers and eventually kill or force a retreat from the remaining scavs. Left with only nine combat-ready operators, they proceed on their mission. Before the USEC operators head to the tunnel system, Mark Forbit asks his computer guy if establishing a connection with the bunker Dennis is currently in is possible. He answers in the affirmative, and after some time, Dennis answers and he and Mr. Forbit have a humorous exchange that eventually ends with Dennis saying that he needs 5 minutes to think about it. After 10 or 15 minutes of no response, Mr. Forbit authorizes the assault on the bunker. After some time, video connection is re-established with the bunker, but this time, it is a bloodied operator from the USEC team. Apparently, Dennis was not even inside the bunker when he made the call, and he had rigged all kinds of various traps for the USEC to discover. They lost several men in the process, including two that may be trapped in a collapsed area of the tunnel. Shocked and dismayed at this outcome, Forbit orders the USEC to immediately return to the base. Back at his bunker inside the city, Dennis gets some much needed rest. While he rested, Oleg sorted through the backpack of various goods and gadgets that Dennis returned with from the Terra Group tunnels. Dennis feels like they're getting closer to what this all might be used for, but they still need to discover more. Oleg and Dennis share stories of what they've picked up on over the years. Before conflict came to Tarkov, container ships and trains full of guns, ammunition, medicine, and rations constantly flowed into Tarkov, all carefully ordered and inventoried by Terra Group. Obviously, Terra Group was preparing for some kind of very serious event, but what? The book then covers a lengthy series of events, where the scavs near Dennis's base is instructed to pick up various drops around Tarkov and deliver them to traders. Each time they do this, not only do the traders give the scavs some items, but there's always something at the drop sites that are marked as being for the scavs. Over time, the ragtag scav group transforms into what is now a considerable scav gang. They number about 50 strong, absorbing loners they come across rather than ambushing and killing them and everyone is now outfitted with modern weapons and some even have armor. But on one trip to collect a drop near the coastal area, a group does not return. It turns out that this group was captured by Ivan the Terrible's raiders, and Peter the cultist priest is still with them. Peter has brought in reinforcement cultists, which appear to be warriors, and have a very intimidating look to them. In the basement of the cottage that the raiders reside in, a former professional criminal serves as their torturer, going by the name The Conductor. He ruthlessly tortures and disfigures the captured scavs until they finally reveal who they've been working for, and it is the Predator. In a meeting between Peter and Ivan, Peter somewhat incorrectly is convinced that Yusek is working with the Predator. Peter thinks it's impossible for the Predator to gain access to Terra Group caches, so the only explanation is that Yusek is giving him equipment. He asks if the raiders will help the cult assault the scav compound, which is basically across the street from Dennis's bunker but Ivan flatly refuses. Peter takes the rejection in stride, thanks him for his hospitality, and leaves with the rest of the cultists the following morning. The book then cuts to a USEC patrol that is responding to a now abandoned USEC building that was fortified inside the city. Why USEC abandoned this building, we don't know, but they left sensors behind as well as all kinds of mines and booby traps in case anyone goes around tampering with their previous base. After making it inside, the USEC in charge is about to check a wall terminal to review its logs and see why a sensor was tripped, when a member of the USEC squad is suddenly dragged by his feet into another room and he instantly goes unconscious. The book then cuts to the USEC man coming to, in a small room that is filled with cultists. One draws back his hood, and it's Peter. Up until now in this book, Peter has been very soft-spoken, maybe even polite to most people he meets. It's very clear that Peter now means business. He tells the USEC man that he's been betrayed by USEC, and that he is to relay to Mark Forbit that he is to deliver the Predator or Dennis to them immediately, or they will suffer consequences. When the captured USEC asks about his squad mates, 
Peter tells him not to worry about them, as they have experienced a fate worse than death. They will never see the coming. The book then cuts to Forbit debriefing the lone surviving USEC operator. After he's dismissed, Forbit accuses the USEC base commander of colluding with the Predator, and the two men have a tense conversation. Eventually, Forbit relents and apologizes, but makes it clear that they need to deliver the Predator to the cultists, and soon. As if they don't, they're about to have the worst enemies they can have in Tarkov. To do this, they need to start with one of the traitors, Kokol. I'd like to stop for a minute and explain that Kokol, if I'm pronouncing that right, has been mentioned numerous times in the past two books and originally went by Ogrizengo, or sometimes Ogrizgo, and is one of the original dealers. The name Kokol is Russian slang for Ukrainian, and according to the Tarkov wiki, he's a future dealer that will be added to the game, specializing mostly in foodstuffs. He's also the bald-headed traitor in the Raid Live Action series, as evidenced from Skiff's line, I guess I need to go visit Ogrizok. I wanted to clear that up as some characters go by two, three, or even four different names in this book and it can get a little confusing. Dennis receives word from this dealer to come see him, because a USEC came around asking for the Predator, and this dealer knows that Dennis works for the Predator. Dennis shows up, and turns out that the USEC is still there. Dennis gives the USEC a radio, instructs him to give it to Mark Forbit, and they will communicate. Meanwhile, cultists are now attacking USEC patrols, and there are losses on both sides. Mark Forbit wonders how long it'll be until this issue can be concluded, and also expresses dismay at the current situation. They are barely ever contacted by USEC or Terror Group Brass, and when they do speak, it's just the same instructions. Just keep holding on. But he's beginning to doubt that there's a next step of this plan. Dennis then calls Mr. Forbit on the supplied radio, and Mr. Forbit makes an extremely weak proposal to Dennis. Even though he had sent a kill squad after Dennis very recently, Forbit suggests that they let bygones be bygones and start anew and that he will compensate Dennis for the inconvenience of past transgressions. Dennis agrees to meet in person, but at Kokol's shop, and that if Mr. Forbit arrives with a massive USEC squad, the bad things could happen, as that is not USEC-controlled territory. Forbit agrees, and even promises to make the last leg of the journey by himself. Over the next chapter, the cultists have positioned themselves near one of Dennis's caches that he regularly sends his next-door scav gang to go collect and drop off at various traders. They are hoping to catch Dennis checking in on the stash, and then capture him. Peter tells one of his cultist brothers that both Dennis's and the Predator's skills are so profound that his real goal is to convert Dennis, the Predator, or both, to their cause. And if he can't, then he must be killed, as they are too dangerous to be free within Tarkov. Dennis, who is just as careful and silent as the cultists themselves, when dropping through the area to check on his stash, notices the cultists in a nearby apartment first, and he decides it's time to deal with them. He enlists the help of one of the same snipers that helped him with Makar's gang, who now has a PTRS anti-tank rifle and offers him a thermal scope, paid in advance, to help him with a task. Barely able to resist a fancy thermal optic for his insanely powerful rifle, he agrees. The book then hints that Dennis has made all kinds of other plans for this confrontation, but first, he must meet with Mark Forbit. The meeting with Mr. Forbit is brief. Dennis enters, and confidently smiles and greets the USEC counterintelligence officer, who mumbles a greeting in return. They waste no time, and as Mark said, he intends to make up for his past disturbances between the two, and he calls over the traitor to inform him that he will pay for a 100,000 euro line of credit for Dennis. Satisfied with this, Dennis agrees to bury the hatchet. Then, Forbit discusses the cultist matter with Dennis, and Dennis says that he has a solution, and the book cuts away to the cultist's perspective. What happens next is basically the final battle of the book. A lot happens, and I would probably have to write several pages to describe it all, so let me just say this. It involves the cultists creating diversion by killing their own people, which at one point, a fellow cultist briefly questioned the orders of Peter. Dennis outsmarted the cultists in typical fashion and created a diversion of his own and forced the cultists, including Peter, into the open so that they could hopefully capture Dennis. When this happened, a huge squad of Dennis's next door scav gang absolutely unloaded on the cultists, as well as the sniper with his anti tank rifle. Also, Dennis brought one of the Terror Group sentry robots with him and equipped it with some rocket launchers that shoot thermobaric missiles. It was pretty crazy. Some of the cultists died extremely gruesome and bloody deaths, and finally, Peter was forced back inside of a building to hopefully link up with the rest of the cultists, although at that point, there weren't many left. Keep in mind that these are not all the cultists within Tarkov. There are other groups. Finally, they are trying to retreat out of the area through an attic, 
and the anti-tank rifle sniper can see tiny thermal signatures through bullet holes in the roof. Knowing that only a couple cultists remain, Dennis decides to finally deal with this personally, and he rampages through the building while throwing copious amounts of grenades and shooting quite a lot. Finally, Peter opens his eyes and it's morning. The battle has been over for some time, and he awakens in incredible pain. Sitting on a wooden beam next to him is Dennis, who addresses himself as the Predator. When he asks why Peter was looking for him, Peter only has the strength to say that he was his enemy and that he must be stopped. At this, Dennis releases a terrifying and creepy laugh that manages to even scare the cultist priest. Dennis then hooks Peter's cultist knife on his belt, beside the other two cultist knives, and basically tells the priest he will not be avenged, and anyone that tries will meet the same fate as he did. Knowing that Peter's spine was broken and he didn't have long to live, he simply left him there and Peter ends up being one of the only people in Tarkov who saw the Predator and knew who he was. And then the book ends. And now for my thoughts. First I'll start with writing style and translation. This book was by far the best written and translated in the series. Grammatical mistakes and poorly translated sentences were few and far between, and it made reading the book far more enjoyable than the other two. In fact, I finished the entire book in about two days. But as far as the writing itself, the book still suffers from an abundance of plot holes and character issues with our main character, Dennis. Dennis is definitely a Mary Sue, or the male equivalent of that. For those that don't know, in books and movies, when a character experiences very little hardships and is seemingly invincible, they are given this name. It cheapens the narrative and drama associated with the character, as since they can overcome nearly every obstacle without breaking a sweat, the reader comes to believe that no harm can ever come to that character, and it eliminates any kind of suspense. I'm going to make a separate video on my thoughts as the series as a whole, and what I think it may have added to the overall lore and story of Tarkov, so make sure you stay tuned for that video. I appreciate you all watching and supporting this channel, it's because of you that these videos are possible. I'm going to get to work on new videos, so until then, I'm Jeff with EUL Gaming, good luck out there.